I do want to just uh, tell you how a little bit more about how the evening is going to go. Um, we're going to uh, have a little presentation. We we'll take a break. There's some snacks in the other room, and while you're taking a break, there's some things over there uh, that we'd like your help with. There's a map up on the wall and some dots. And if you would be willing, uh, certainly not mandatory, but if you'd be willing to put your dot on the on the map and just to show us where you live, um, that would give us a good sense of who is here and where you live in the area. Certainly don't have to, but um, it would be helpful. Um, there are also some. Uh, those giant post-it notes up in the, in the other room and there are some questions that we've asked and so you've got in your packets you've got some tear-off post-it notes so if you've got something that you want to know more about a question that you have uh, we invite you to write it on that post-it note and put it up up there that by no means means that we're not going to have uh, you know open question and answer but not everybody's comfortable some people are real comfortable talking in a group not everybody's comfortable talking in a group and we want to hear from all of you um, there are lots of Lots of you here, and you know, maybe have very different uh, thoughts or questions about uh, what's going on here. So we want to make sure that we hear from everybody. So, um, so then after you've been next door, have a snack, got your questions up, then we're going to come back and we're going to have an open forum for questions. Um, there's a mic there, and I know this seems like a small room and kind of maybe a little bit overkill. But not everybody does here well, so we're going to ask you to step up to the mic and ask your question. Um, and you can be thinking now about what that question might be. Uh, there are a lot of you, so probably you should let other people, you know, if you've got a question, maybe you know, pose your question. But then let's make sure everybody's had a chance to ask a question before you maybe ask a second one. So, anything else, Karen? Uh, no, we have um, index cards okay. placed around. Um, if you feel more comfortable just writing your question down on those and handing them to me at the break, we can uh, ask. The, we can answer those when we get back. Okay. That's about it. Okay. So here we go. Okay. So when it comes to chemicals, um, so just some really basic information about the ways that we think about how to understand the way people might be exposed to chemicals. There are. Uh, a few what we call exposure pathways. There's the inhalation pathway. So things, chemicals sometimes float in the air. Uh, they, they do what's called volatilizing, things that are volatile like volatile, which means it turns from a liquid state to a gas state very quickly. And so things that reside in a gaseous state can float around in the air, wow, that's really loud, um, can float around in the air and are possible to be inhaled. So if you inhale something, you inhale a chemical, that's called the inhalation exposure pathway. Um, then there So ingestion means you eat it, you swallow it, you drink it, you eat it on food, um, and there might be a chemical on that food, and so now you've gotten it into your body, and your body can absorb those chemicals from, from your uh, internal organs. Um, and then finally, there is the dermal pathway, what we call skin absorption. I know the skin looks like it's a it's a, um, uh, a flat surface, but it's really very porous. So um, obviously, we sweat, so water comes out, things can go in, and you can absorb chemicals through your skin. So when we think about um, chemicals and how chemicals might get into to, to bodies, we think about how to examine all those different exposure pathways that might be might be possible. So from the simple to the complex, I was really meant to, to say there are a lot of chemicals. You know, we live in a world, you know, like it or not like it, not like it. We live in a world that has a lot of chemicals in it. Um, I have chemicals in my watch. You have chemicals in your phone. We have chemicals on our crops. Uh, we have chemicals. We have chemicals all around us. And so when we're thinking about all the different sources of chemicals and all the different ways that they might be getting into humans, um, we have to think about all these sort of different complex, sorry, all these different um, complex scenarios that could be contributing to um, the sources uh, of those chemicals, how they're getting to you, if, if they're getting into you, but how much, and then if so, what, what kind of damage they might be doing. All these different pathways. Okay. Let's talk about pesticides for a second. We have a lot of pesticides in Oregon. The pesticide use reporting system in 2008, this just came from the, the, the PERS reporting system, reported 
over 19.5 million pounds of pesticides used in Oregon per year. A lot of pesticides. Pesticides have their use. They obviously have their uses. They also are serious chemicals. Chemicals that we regulate because they're serious chemicals. They're designed they're by their design. They're designed to interrupt biologic processes. So that's why we take such care with them. We, we must be careful with these chemicals. They're used in agriculture. They're used in road maintenance, uh, yeah, around utility lines, um, on the roads. They're used in forestry. They're used in people's homes. They're used in people's buildings. You know, the, the fogger that people are using or the, the folks that are coming in to deal with ants. We have pesticides kind of around us. <clears throat> so, given all of that information, given all of those constraints and concerns and what it is that we're trying to do here, we're working within some, some constraints of just even what is possible. I'm going to take you through some of that. So in any kind of a scientific investigation, there are things that we know, things that we don't know, things that are knowable and things that are not knowable. Some things that are unknowable are unknowable because it's just impractical. It's impossible given the resources that we have. And some things are unknowable just because they're not knowable. We can't, we can't go back and um, figure something out that happened in the past with you know, specific specificity. So in this particular situation, I just want to take you through how we're thinking about it so you can understand how we've gotten uh, to the place where we're going to be talking about the investigation. <clears throat> okay. So here's that there are pesticides used in this area. We know that there are multiple sources of pesticides used in this area. They're used in agriculture, they're used in uh, people's homes and industrial settings for road maintenance and in forestry. And we know that some people here are very concerned about uh, exposures to pesticides. And we know that some po folks here had their urine tested in uh, the spring of this year, and that two pesticides were detected in the urine of those folks who were tested. <clears throat> so here's what we don't know. Here's what we don't know is where all of the pesticides are in this environment. We don't know all of where they are in water or land or air. Um, we don't know how many people here are coming into pop contact with pesticides. If people here are coming into contact with pesticides, we don't know um, if, the, if the, the contact, the exposures are continuous, if they're happening in kind of a chronic way or if they're happening intermittently, when a specific application happens and then, then it, it doesn't happen. We don't know how long the exposures have been going on. <clears throat> we don't know what levels people are being exposed to. And we don't know specifically if people's health has been affected by those exposures. Okay, so here's what back in my thing. <clears throat> it's really distracting. And if you're, if you're meaning to distract me, it's working. So could I really ask you to just hang on just a bit? Okay. So here's, what, here's what's possible to know. Okay. We can know, given the methods that are available, if 2,4-D, which is the two pesticides that were detected in urine in the spring, are detectable in people's urine. We can know if, um, the, if we detect met, uh, urine, uh, detect the pesticides in urine, we can know how those people compare to other people. We can know um, if pesticides are in plants or water or air or animals. We can know um, how those levels in environmental materials compare to levels known or, or suspected to cause harm. We can know some of the ways that people come into contact with pesticides, and we can know if those exposures are continuous, happening on a regular basis, or if they're intermittent. <clears throat> and we can know 
if the people who uh, join us in a group of folks who might be willing to be studied could be affected by the pesticides if we detected it in the okay. Here's what's not knowable. <coughs> not part of the study that we're going to be engaging in. We're not going to be able to know, given our data, if they're being exposed. We're not going to be able to know if those exposures occurred in the past or if they will occur in the future beyond the study period. And we're not going to be able to know if any kind of health conditions that they may have are specifically related to those exposures, even if we are able to test them. We're only going to be able to know if they could be. 